we stand together this morning? I just want to sing a song together this morning. It's an old song. It's called Reach Out and Touch the Lord. Maybe you know it. Reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. You'll find he's not too busy to hear your heart's cry. He's passing by this moment your needs to supply. Just reach out and touch the Lord as he goes by. Can we just praise him this morning and just reach out and touch him? He's here today. Just reach out and touch him as he's passing by. Thank you, Jesus. I love the Lord. You can be seated. I'm glad to see each of you here this morning and glad for those that are watching online. There were three men hiking in the woods, and they came across a raging river that they needed to cross. The first man said, Lord, give me the strength to cross this river, and poof, he had big muscles, and he was able to swim across the river in about an hour and a half, and he nearly drowned two times as he was trying to swim across the river. The second man said, Lord, give me, he looked at what happened to that man, and he said, Lord, give me the strength and the tools to cross the river, and poof, a lifeboat appeared. And he had the strength to get into the lifeboat and row across the river in about an hour, nearly capsizing a couple of times with the boat, but he made it. And the third man said, Lord, he saw what happened to the first one and the second one, he said, Lord, give me the strength and the tools and the intelligence to cross this river, and poof, God turned him into a woman. That's pretty funny, but then she looked at the map, hiked up the trail about 200 yards, and walked over the bridge. Dad said, that's not funny. <laughs> today I want to talk to you about something that may seem a little funny, and the title of this lesson today is Pigs and Pearls. That may be a funny little cartoon up there, but you're going to see the truth in it. If you'll just stay with me, we're going to get some revelation this morning. In Mark chapter 5, we find that Jesus comes into the country of Gadarene. There was a demon-possessed man there who lived in a graveyard. The Bible says he lived among the tombs, which is the graveyard. And he lived there, and it says he screamed day and night, and he cut himself. He cut himself so he would bleed, and everyone thought he was crazy. And apparently they tried to chain him up because the Bible says he broke the chains and he could not be held. They had tried to chain this man up like a dog. He was, he was so out there. He was a nuisance to the neighborhood and out of control. Anybody ever had a, a neighbor that was a nuisance? <laughs> My husband said everywhere he goes. Well, this guy was a major nuisance. He was out of control. But when Jesus showed up on the scene, he ran to Jesus. And Jesus cast the demons out of them, out of him, and he sent them into a herd of pigs, and the pigs ran off the cliff and into the sea. Well, naturally, word got out really quick about that. Don't you think that would get out quick if something like that happened in your community? And everyone came around. They wanted to see if what they had heard was true. And in Mark, uh, what chapter was that? Thir chapter 5, verse 15. If you want to turn in your Bible, or I believe we have it on the screen. It says, and they came to Jesus to see him that was possessed with the devil and had the legion. He was sitting and clothed and in his right mind, and they were all afraid. Say he was in his right mind. And they that saw it told them how it befell to him that he was possessed with the devil. The ones that saw it happen, they were telling how it happened that he was possessed with the devil, and also concerning the swine. The ones that saw the miracle told all about him being delivered and being set free from the demons, and also concerning the swine. They were also concerned with the swine, with the pigs. 
Because you see, it was a type of living for the people who owned the pigs. And they just lost a bunch of money when those pigs ran over the cliff and into the sea. They weren't really concerned about the man who had been living naked in the graveyard and cutting himself and screaming day and night and going crazy in his mind. They really weren't concerned about him. They weren't concerned that now he was sitting up and clothed and in his right mind. They were angry because they had lost their pigs. But the pigs had to go. They asked Jesus to leave. Get out of here. Get out of our town. We don't want no more of that happening. We don't want no more miracles and people being delivered and set free if we're going to have to lose our pigs. Just get on and get out of here. Concerning the pigs. They were concerned with the pigs. But my Bible says... Don't cast your pearls before the swine. That's a funny thing to say, isn't it? Because why would I throw my pearls in front of pigs anyway? If I had a string of pearls, why would I do that? Why would I throw them to pigs? But isn't that just what we do sometimes? Because you see, a pig has no regard for pearls. He treats pearls just like he treats corn husk. If they're in the pen with the pig, he's going to try to eat it. He's going to stomp all over it. He's going to waller it in the mud. But what exactly is a pearl? You know, we, we know of it as a necklace or some earrings or a pretty a base that might be made out of some pearl material. But a pearl, it's a precious stone. It's the one precious stone or metal that's not carved out of the earth. You don't dig for pearls. You don't excavate for pearls. Gold is dug from the earth. Silver is excavated from the earth. Diamonds are mined from the earth. But pearls don't originate in the earth. A pearl happens when an irritant or a piece of sand gets into an oyster, and it causes a wound in that oyster. Inside of an oyster, you know, if you eat oysters, you know what they're like. They're soft. They're tender. But when a piece of sand gets into that oyster, it causes a wound. It cuts the oyster. It causes a wound, and it irritates the soft lining, and it scratches, and it cuts, and it wounds. And in an effort to protect itself, the oyster starts to secrete these minerals and nacre. I'm not sure if that's how you say it, but it's N-A-C-R-E. It secretes this stuff around the sand, and it forms a protective cover to keep the wound from going any deeper. It produces layers and layers of this substance over the sand for many, many years. It can take up to five years for a pearl to be formed from a single grain of sand. So you can see why they're so valuable. You can see why an oyster is, I mean, why a pearl is valuable. Matthew chapter 13 and verse 45 it says, again, the kingdom of heaven is like unto a merchant man seeking goodly pearls, who when he had found one pearl of great price, he went and sold all that he had. He sold everything, and he bought it. He bought that pearl of great price. Today I'm looking out on these pews, and I see some people whose testimonies are pearls. They're pearls of great price. You've been through years of irritants. You've been through years of foreign things that God didn't design to be in your life, but due to our own bad choices and our own circumstances, we found that we were hurt and we were wounded. But many of you chose to do like the oyster, and you took those offenses. You took those wounds, and you allowed God to create a pearl out of your hurts, your habits, and your hang-ups instead of allowing them to kill you and destroy you. The life you're living today, your sobriety, your family, your testimony, it's a pearl. It's a pearl of great price, and it's worth something. It's very valuable. Don't throw it to the pigs. They will have no regard for it. They won't think twice about stomping it in the mud. They won't think twice about it. Luke 15 tells us a story about a young man who told his father to give him his inheritance. Give me all that's coming to me. I want it all. I want to get out of here. I'm tired of being in your house. I want to go my own way. So his father gave him his money, and he took it, and he went out, and the Bible says he spent all that he had on riotous living. In today's vernacular, that would be he spent all that he had on drinking, drugging, and women. He spent it all. 
He had lots of friends to party with as long as he was paying the bill. Man, around for everybody. Who doesn't like that guy? You know, I got the tab. I'm going to pick it up. But when his money ran out, so did his friends. And he found himself alone. He found himself in a pig pen eating corn husk with the pigs. But you know, the Bible says he came to himself. He came to himself. You see, he wasn't himself when he was out there doing all that stuff. He knew better. He knew better than to take all of his money and spend it partying and throwing it away. He knew better. But he wasn't himself. And the Bible says he came to himself. Now, it doesn't say that his father went out combing the highways and the byways looking for him. It doesn't say his father texted him 40 times a day to see how he was doing. It doesn't say his father called him multiple times. It doesn't say his father sent out a search party and brought him home. No. It doesn't say that. It says he came to himself. He came to himself. And when he got his head straight, he came to himself. And he said, even the servants in my father's house are eating better than this. Even the people that work for my dad, they're doing better than this. I'm going home. He said, I'm going home. And when he got close to his house and he headed down the driveway, the father saw him from afar off because he'd been checking. He'd been looking to see if he was coming. And when he saw him, the Bible says he ran to him and he fell on him and he said, my son that was dead is now alive. He's alive again. And that's just how Jesus is. He stands at the door and knocks. He's waiting for you to make the first move and then he's going to run to you with open arms and he's going to say, welcome home, my child. Welcome home. But the prodigal son had to get up and he had to get away from the pigs. He couldn't wear his pearls while he was living in the hog pen. Because you know what them pigs would have done? They'd have ate them pearls right off of his neck. There's something, though, I want to say to this church and to everyone that's listening online, and I'm sure you're going to start hearing this a lot around here. As God moves us in a different dimension, you're going to hear this a lot more. It's okay to not be okay. If you're sitting by someone, look at them and say, it's okay to not be okay. We heard a great message this week at, because of the times on mental health. People don't like to deal with mental health. That, that's a subject nobody wants to talk about. It's the elephant, the white elephant in the room. And many of you sitting here this morning, you may de be dealing with some mental health issues. And honestly, I don't know many people in 2023 that haven't in the last few years dealt with some mental health issues. The last few years have been hard. We, we've lost loved ones some through COVID, some through addictions, others we've lost through tragedies, but loss nonetheless. We've lost people that we've loved. We've been through major hurricanes and storms. We've been through financial loss, health issues. All of these things take a toll on us mentally and emotionally. Suicide is at an all-time high. If you don't know that today, suicide is at an all-time high. Anxiety and depression is at an all-time high time high mental illness is real people it's real it's not just something that's in your head it is real you can't just say well just pray about it Angela you've been a little anxious lady late lately we'll just pray about it honey that doesn't work how many of you know somebody that's been depressed or they've been anxious and they prayed about it they got on their knees, they sought God, they prayed, they cried till snot was running out their nose and all over their face and all over their carpet. But when they got up, they were still depressed. We need to have a safe place where people can come and not feel judged and not feel crazy because they're suffering mentally. We need to have that here in Pearl River. It's okay to not be okay. It's okay. It doesn't mean you're in sin because you're depressed or you're anxious. It doesn't mean that. It doesn't mean you're crazy. Many of the greatest Christians that I know have suffered from depression and anxiety or other mental disorders. 
they still loved God. They still prayed. They still read their Bibles. They still went to church. But depression was still there, and the anxiety was still there, and the anger was still there. But so was God. So was God. God loves us, and he will go to great lengths to let us know how much he loves us. Our goal and our desire in starting these recovery meetings is to create a safe place where people can come and they can share without fear of being judged. Wouldn't you like that? A place where they can talk about their hurts, their habits, and their hang-ups and to make available other resources where mental health treatment is available. Now this morning I want to tell you that mental health struggles are nothing new. It didn't start since COVID started. This is not new. Even Paul said in Romans chapter 7, verse 18. Paul said, because I know that in me, in my flesh, there is no good thing. Nothing good dwells in me. For to will is present with me, but how to perform that which is good, I find not. I want to. I want to perform that which is good, but I can't find it. For the good that I would, I do not, but the evil which I would not do, that I do. Now, if I do that, I would not. Is it no, it's no more I that do it, but it's sin that dwells in me. And I find then a law that when I would do good, evil is present with me. For I delight in the law of God after the inward man, but I see another law in my members warring against the law of my mind and bringing me into captivity to the law of sin, which is in my members. Oh, wretched man that I am, who shall deliver me from this body of death? I thank God through Jesus Christ our Lord, so that when the mind, I, with the mind, I myself serve the law of God, but with the flesh, the law of sin. This is Paul. He said, I want to do good, and even though I try, I don't do good. And the things I don't want to do, I find myself doing. He was struggling. This is the writer of the majority of the New Testament, Paul. He struggled with some mental things. They didn't run him off because he had struggles. They didn't say, get out of here, Paul. You can't write no more books. You got some mental issues. We don't want you. He was still doing a great work for the Lord and for the kingdom of God. But he had some struggles. And there was a battle going on in his mind. We talked a couple of weeks ago about being transformed, about your mind being transformed. And in this transformation process that we're all going through, we're still living in a mortal body. This thing bleeds. If you come up here and cut me with a knife today, I'm going to bleed. It's not immortal. It's mortal. We still live in this body. Our mind and our body are two different things. In the process of transformation, you're still going to have your brain to deal with, which is a part of your body. And your brain might tell you something that's contrary to the Word of God. But remember, I told you that your mind is a battlefield. Your mind is a battlefield. There's a war going on for control of your mind. The devil would like to make you identify yourself by whatever you're suffering with. Instead of, I'm battling depression, he wants you to say, I am depressed. Instead of, I'm battling with addiction, he wants you to say, I am an addict. He wants you to identify with what you're battling. You're not what you are battling. You're not that. You are loved by the mighty God. You were so loved, in fact, that he came down from his throne and put flesh around his own self and died on a cross, the ultimate sacrifice, so that you and so that me could be saved. That's what he did. I want you to stand with me today in a spirit of prayer and and nobody moving around. Just stand. Get your mind on the Lord. The Lord's going to keep waiting for you, and he's going to keep reaching for you. And I love that song that says, there's no shadow you won't light up. No mountain you won't climb up coming after me. There's no wall you won't kick down. There's no lie you won't tear down coming after me. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending, reckless love of God. I couldn't earn it. I couldn't do anything to earn it. I don't deserve it. Oh, the overwhelming, never-ending 
reckless love of God. Man, that's how much he loves us today. If you're struggling today, if you're away from God, if you think God doesn't love you because of the mess in your mind, please don't think that. Shake yourself. Come to yourself and realize you've got a Father who loves you. Get out of the pig pen. Pick up your pearls and come home. Your Father is waiting with open arms. He's ready to throw a party. He's ready to throw a party, have a feast, and welcome you home. We're here to help you. This church is here to help you. But most importantly, Jesus is here, and he loves you this morning more than you can possibly know. As our pastor comes, can we just raise our hands and thank him for his eternal love? Hallelujah. Come on, let's worship him today. We love you, Jesus. We glorify your name. Hallelujah, 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 hallelujah. Come on, let's just talk to him. Thank you for what you heard today. Hallelujah, we love you, Jesus. We glorify your name. We worship you today. Thank you, Jesus. Well, it's good to see everyone that's in the house of the Lord today. We're so thankful that you chose uh, to get up, get dressed, and be here. We love you for that. To our media audience, we once again, as we say each Sunday, we love you, and you're a part of our church. And uh, we pray that one day you're going to be able to come in be in church with us in person and not be at your home watching but can come actually be here to everybody today we're glad to be in the house of the lord i really don't see any guests today but it is good to see my sweet friend back here miss karen and good to have you in the house of the lord with us today <laughs> hallelujah praise god hallelujah so thank you Jesus. just continue to believe god that god is going to move if you're here today uh, uh, Taryn, you, you have to help me with this. Jack had requested prayer for a... Okay, Brittany Lazana. Okay, uh, passed away, young lady, and uh, but the, she is leaving behind a grieving family, and we need to pray that that family can receive comfort from the Lord uh, during this time. A few requests that's on our screen today. We want to... Uh, remember those and I'd ask right now if you would just get somebody on your mind that you know they need prayer do anybody here know somebody that needs prayer we just begin to call their name out as we go to him in prayer today most gracious God of heaven as we come before you today God we come before you with our needs you said cast all of your cares upon you Lord because you care for our soul God, you care for our well-being. You care for our health. You care for our mental health. You care for our finances. God, you care for the things that we need to sustain us in life. And today, God, we trust you, God. We believe you, Jesus. And we know that you're going to do great and mighty works for us today. God, we invite you in. Come in today. Touch our heart. Change our heart. Change the way we think, God. We ask you, Lord, just make of us what you want us to be in Hallelujah. Jesus name let's worship the Lord in song thank you Jesus Hallelujah. how great is our God come on sing with me how great is our God oh see how great how great Oh, 
Because he can give it to you. Hallelujah. If you come today and you're hurting, you're down, you're depressed, whatever you need today, I want to tell you, we serve a God that can answer our prayers and he knows our needs. We're going to worship him. Are you going to worship the God that is able to do abundantly, exceedingly above all we ask or even think? Hallelujah. Wow, I want to worship him today. Hallelujah. Thank you, Lord. He counts the stars one and all. He knows how much sand is on the shores. He sees every sparrow that falls. He made the mountains and the sea. He's in control of everything, of all creatures great and small. But this is the part I love. He knows my name, every step that I take, every move that I make.
every move that I make. He sees every tear that I cry. He sees it. He sees every tear. He knows my name. He knows when I'm overwhelmed, when I'm overwhelmed by the pain. I can't even look up and see the light of day. When I can't even see the light of day, I know I'm going to be just fine. Because he knows my Every step that I take, every move that I make, every tear that I cry, He knows my name when I'm overwhelmed by the pain. I can't see the light of day, I know I'll be just fine, cause He knows my name. you glad he sees the tears he sees the tears that we cry hallelujah oh hallelujah. i love you lord hallelujah oh thank, thank you, you lord thank you, you know Jesus. my name you know thank my you, name Jesus. lord so once again can we just slip our hands up today and love him we love you jesus we love you jesus thank you for loving us god Thank you for loving us, Jesus. We love you, we love you, we love you, we love you, we love you. God bless you today. You may be seated. It is good to be back home. Reese and I left. We left a day early. We were supposed to have left on Tuesday, but we would have had to leave about 5 o'clock in the morning. We decided we wanted to go back uh, before because of the time they were having a sevens meeting and we wanted to be there so we left early on when on monday and uh you know it, it wasn't a relaxing trip uh we were in church nearly about the entire time we would uh we went on the tuesday morning and got back to the hotel room about three uh just laid around for just an hour or so, had to get dressed, go back to church that night, got in about 10.30 that night, next morning, get up and do it all over again, but it was wonderful. But just want to share with you uh, uh, something that we've seen, and it was great to be able to experience this. Uh, during the, the first night when Brother Anthony, the bishop of the church, was preaching, uh, the United Pentecostal Organization, uh, has missionaries all around the world. Thank God for those missionaries uh, that go because God knows I don't want to go, Pop. I'm, I'm good where I'm at. Uh, but we have missionaries all around the world. And Brother Anthony said, wouldn't it be good? And I don't, I wish I'd remember the man's name, but he is the pastor there in Ukraine. Sergi. And he said, it would be wonderful. Pastor Sergi. Pastor Sergi. Wouldn't it be wonderful if Pastor Sergi, and Brother Anthony, he, he's known for the dramatics. And he wouldn't be good if he could just join us by, uh, by FaceTime. And so he sat there dialing his number. And he said, come on in and join us. And all of a sudden, those double doors opened. And his pastor and his wife, he had flown them in from Ukraine, from that battlefield where this war is happening right now. And they walked into that church and gave their testimony. Brother Sergi said this. Buildings all around us, Brother Albert, around the church building there. He said, homes in front of us. A Russian bomb hit it, exploded, destroyed those homes and killed a lot of civilians, a lot of people. There was a warehouse behind their church. There was buildings on the side of those church, and all of those buildings have been destroyed. But one, not one bomb has hit that church with hundreds of people hid inside seeking shelter in the church. He brought Brother Anthony a fragment of a piece of a Russian bomb that exploded so close that it wound up at the front door of that church. But listen, God sustained that church Amen. and those people that were in that church. That's the God we serve. God we serve. 
And so on third, uh, on Wednesday night, uh, Brother Sergio needed $250,000 to be able to go back. And you may not understand why a man would need $250,000, but that he, uh, you have to go out on deputation raising money because they don't work when they're there in these mission fields. And Brother Anthony said, I believe we can raise $250,000. I'd like to raise $250,000 this morning. Man, you wouldn't be able to keep my feet on the ground. I, I'd be trying to preach on top of this pulpit. I already know not to sit on it. Uh, but you know me, I would try. And, uh, but that night we watched as the Holy Ghost and the Spirit of giving took over that church about between 3,500 and maybe 25, uh, probably 32 to 2,500 people. They were probably more than that because the foyers and little setting areas were full of people that couldn't get inside were watching on the screens that was prepared outside. But in a matter of 15 minutes, we were able to see as people gave $712,000. I think God deserved We didn't do it. God did it. Praise God. So the pastor there is going to be able to return and go right back uh, home. He won't have to go out on deputation. The need has been met and, and even more. That's the God we serve. Amen. God takes care of it. I say God, God takes does. care of it. Yes. Last night, Reese and I, when we, we lay down and uh, went to sleep, I, I guess I finally fell off sleep about somewhere between 1 and 2 this morning. Just was restless, couldn't sleep, probably rested too much. And uh, But this morning when Reese got up, she went outside and I began to hear her say, Baby, come, come see, come and see. And last night while we were sleeping, we had got a... A little playhouse from uh, Adam and his uh, ex-wife. They gave it, given it to us, and we put it behind the house for Rowan when he comes over. And Bella uh, plays on that little playhouse. But when we were fixing a little birthing house for Reese's dog, we moved that that playhouse closer to our house. Now we Reese's a little birthing house is actually nicer than our house, and <laughs> but. Uh, we, I told her, I said, baby, I don't have time to run, actually run, so we're just going to use a cinch of cord, and, you know, like my daddy would do, and we just drape it over some stuff, and, and we drop it down. Uh, and but the, the little house is wired correctly, but the feed to the house wasn't. And when she walked outside, this is about two foot from our house, and when we walked out during the night, that little house had caught fire, and it just burned all night long. The playhouse. The little playhouse. And when I looked, Pop, at that side there where it was all burnt out, I said, God, you are so good. Right beside our bedroom window. We could have burnt to death last night. But God said, hey, I, I'm going to protect those that we love. There is benefits in living for God. I said there are benefits in living for God. God has been so merciful to us, and Reese and I are in debate with each other what started it, and, uh, but she did, and I, I will say this because I just want to make you aware of it. She had ordered some little night lights, some LED night lights off of Amazon or somewhere, and a few weeks ago, uh, one of those night lights shorted out in our bathroom and nerd about caught our house on fire. She got up the next morning and said, I smell electrical, and we found it. And, uh, and so that, there was one of them night lights there. So the reason I told you that, if you've ordered some little bitty square night lights on Amazon, throw them jokers away. Just, just believe what I'm telling you. Throw them away. They are defected. And so uh, I'm pretty sure that that caused some heat to transfer back and caused that fire. Whatever, I know who protected me last night. I know why I'm in church today. Praise God. If you have your tithing offer, let's say it. Isn't it wonderful today that we are able to sow into the kingdom of God and to bring our tithing offering, the tithe that he has blessed us uh, with uh, uh, the means to support ourselves. 
and we are going to be able to give it, give a portion of that back to God. Is that it? Okay. I knew it was, uh, it was in my, I didn't know who put this in my, I thought it was for me. Oh, my God. Oh. But anyway, uh, we, we're able today. So hold it up and say, God, we give to you this with a, with a heart of giving. And God, you said in your word, if we would put you first and we would do the principles that are taught in the word of God, that we would be the head and not the tail. Amen. God, you said we would be the lender and not the bar. Now, God, we stand upon the principles of your word. In Jesus' name, bring your tithe and offer today. No one can touch you like Jesus can. today I'm glad for that God bless you you may be seated today we are just excited about what God is doing I want to remind you just in case it's folks mind at the end of the service tomorrow tomorrow we start our Daniel fast 21 days and so if you are fasting with us we pray for you and if you're not fasting with us you pray for us we're going to need it. Praise God. But I did tell some of the church today in the prayer room that I usually have such a dread uh, when the time for fasting comes around. And we fast a lot during the year, but when we call a corporate fast or for those that want to fast with us, I usually just dread that day. But I'm actually looking forward to tomorrow. Reese said, well, if you're looking forward to it, you can start today. I said, I'll wait till tomorrow. Um, I'm not lo really looking forward to the fast, but I'm looking forward to what the fast is going to produce. And I am so uh, thankful uh, for you that will be joining us on this fast. We had a wonderful time last week. I wish that I had the ability to just pour out of me what has been poured into me in the last three days. It was truly a great experience. I told several people that I've spoke with since we've got back that I started going to Because of the Times in 1985, so that's a long time. This next year will be 40 years that they've been having this ministerial meeting. It's a place where pastors and leaders in the church go people that are involved in ministry go and, and we get poured into. Because as leaders, we're constantly pouring out. But you can't pour out what you don't have. Come on. I said you can't pour out what you don't have. And so it is a great time. So I don't know how many of those uh, meetings that I've made over the 40 years, 
uh, but I made a lot of meetings. I, I told Sister Tawana and Angela Day when we were in the prayer room, never been a time that I went to because of the time, which now they call it bot, uh, short for because of the time. I've never been there that I wouldn't preach to, Pop. I was always preached to and heard great message and message that encouraged us. But about a month ago, right at, right at the first of the year, well, it's not really been a, really a whole month, but we actually began to, Reese and I began to try to plan what, and to try to seek the face of God and plan around God's plan of what God wants out of us of 23. And so we begin to seek direction. And sometime in seeking direction, when we begin to, feel that God has us moving in a certain area, we like, no, no, I don't want to go there. You know, that ain't the direction I want to go. Well, most of the time, God don't send us where we want to go. Okay. But as we prayed and God began to give direction, and then I even uh, reached out to Prophet Johnson. Risa tell you, as, as the pastor of this church, I, I, I don't reach out to other, I, I'm in trouble usually when I reach out to another pastor. I mean, I just can't take it. You know, I feel like that God speaks to me and gives me direction for my ministry, for the people that follow me. But a few weeks ago, I did just call to ask him to pray. He had prophesied something over me about five years ago uh, in the presence of about 400 people. And I jokingly said to Reese, He's never missed it on anything he ever prophesied to me, but he missed it on this. <laughs> and so uh, the Lord has been giving me dreams, bringing back dreams that I had uh, over 10 years ago when I was still, still pretty much decided I would never preach again or pastor again. And God gave me a dream. I can tell you where the dream took place. It took place in San Antonio, Texas. I called Reese the next day squalling and crying, but I still wasn't ready and willing to get back into the pastoral field. And then a few weeks ago, God gave me that identical dream again. And so during the time of this, this meeting being poured into and the things that we heard were actually confirmation of what God, the, it corresponds with the dream and where I feel that God has us. And the most important thing in all of our lives that we're in the will of God and we please God. That is the most important thing in our life. So during this meeting, uh, I was... Sitting there, the Lord began to speak to me, and he gave me a message. Or, or, I, I guess you say it's a message. It, and probably not going to get loud, and not going to get hard, and I hope that I can keep it interesting enough that you'll stay awake today and listen at what God has gave me for this church and, and for me. But as God began to speak it to me, I just was flipping through my uh, phone because, you know, we got a, we got a Bible on our phone. And if you don't, you should. It's an app. Download it. And while I was doing that, Reese, I guess I got engrossed and uh, probably had my head down a little longer than I thought. And the next thing I know, she had stabbed me with a pen in the leg. Now, it wasn't bad, but I, I did. She got my attention. I looked at her and I said, why did you stab me? And she said, I can't believe it. You doing what you get aggravated when you see people doing. You're, you're sitting there. And she thought I was just reading something on the phone, but it was actually, I was just running some looking at some scriptures of what God has uh, spoke to me about today. And so I know that I come to this pulpit with a word from the Lord. There's no doubt about it. I hope that God will anoint your ears, your mind, that you can stay with me and as I preach to you. I've asked God, I, when God gave me this, when I went home that evening and we're laying in the motel room and Reese had just took a nap, and I said, God, please, I, 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 don't let me, don't make me have to preach this or tell this to my church, but I accept what you're saying to me. You see, sometimes God says things that's for us, not meant for everybody. And sometimes he speaks things that's meant for the church. 
And I knew it was for the church. And I know it's God trying to move us. Listen, if you, if you're, if you have any ability to think and to see what is going on, you realize this world is winding up. There is destruction. There's sin. There, the things that that our world is God involved in, and, and it's. It is getting worse, and the Bible tells us as these things would happen, and that that things would happen, and so much that people would cry out, and they would even cry out to the Lord, but uh, some of them wouldn't hear from God. But the Antichrist would come on the scene, and he would deceive thousands because he would have the answer uh, to saving this world. Well, that's a good example or, or, or a good thing for you to note that if it don't matter who it is, if it's Donald Trump in the next four years, if he comes out and he's got the, he says he's got the answer to save the world, this world's not going to be saved. According to the Word of God, it's going to melt. It's going to burn up. So we realize that we're living in perilous times, as the Bible was saying. That word perilous means we're living in a risky time. And so we, we realize that today. And so I feel today that I want to share with you and, and, and I hope that what God has given me will help you. Will you pray for me right now? Can we all go together and just stretch your hands toward me and say, God, help our pastor today to be able to speak what you've given him, Lord. And God, I ask you to anoint my ears that I can hear what you have said to him. For us today, we ask in Jesus' name. Amen. I want to read just a couple of verses of scripture, and it's just uh, this here just to get started. It's from it be my text today. It's from James chapter one and verse twenty three, I think, through maybe twenty five. For if ye be a hearer of the word, and not a doer, he is likened unto a man beholding his natural face in the glass. For he beholdeth himself, and goeth his way, and straightway forgetteth what manner of man he was. But whosoever looketh into the perfect law of liberty, and continueth therein, he being, a, he being not a forgetful hearer, but a doer of the word, he shall be blessed and all of his deeds. Come on. You understand what, what he's the writer saying? You're, you're looking in a mirror. You're looking into this glass. And you see who you are. And that's not seeing the natural man. I believe that's talking about seeing the spiritual man. And understanding that. And understanding that we were called by God for a purpose. Everybody say a purpose. And a time such as this. A time such as this. I believe that I am speaking today to people that are, are called by God for such a time as this. If I were to stop today and, and I were to begin to single out each of us today and let you tell your story. It would really be amazing how different walks of life that each of us come from. I may mention that a few months ago we were all in the church and when, when it was done we had shared about spending time in the big house. And so we, had all, we were all laughing and talking about it and it was several of us and and, and Reese looked, and she looked at Sister Tawana, and she said, Well, Tawana, I guess you and me are the only ones that hadn't been to jail. And Tawana dropped her head and said, No, Sister Reese, I've been in jail. I'm not asking you today, have you, have you been in jail? But we, we're all made up. Some of us have, have come from lifestyles and been in places that we really shouldn't even be here today. We should be dead. But God, everybody say, but God. But God. You see, we, we could have burned up last night, but God. You see, I could be dead today, but God. God has a place, and God has a perfect will 
for each of our lives. But it's sometimes with us, it is hard for us to line our desires, our wants, and what we think we need and let it work with God's plan. But I found over the years that if I submit myself to God's plan, it's always a lot better. But still, I struggle with that. Come on. You know, we're no different than the, the person with a, an addiction. They know that the addiction is killing them, and, it, and they want to stop, and they know that they should stop, but they don't stop. Because it's hard, because we're fighting against flesh. None of us here today are so spiritual that you're not fighting a fleshly warfare in your mind. When we lay our head down at night and we try to go to sleep, I wonder today, is there anybody here that when you lay down to go to sleep at night, there's a war that begins in your mind and you start thinking about, oh my God, if I'd have done this, Oh my God, I need to do... We're all fighting battles in our minds. Most of our battles are fought in our mind, and most of the battles that we go through with is simply because we have not reached a place of submission in our life. They jumped the gun on me a little bit, so I'll just go ahead and tell you. Turn to your neighbor and point at them. Or your neighbor and say to them, Hi, my name's Jonah. It may seem a little strange, but this is what the Lord began to deal with me when I was at, at that sevens meeting on Tuesday, and I'm sitting there and I'm, I'm hearing God speak to me, and, and immediately when He spoke these words to my heart, I began to go back and I preached about Jonah probably hundreds of times since I've been in the ministry uh, you know, there, there are certain things in the Bible that it don't take a lot of study and pop. You just read that story and you can preach about it. And so as I begin to look and I begin to read a little bit uh, in, in Jonah, in that, that first chapter of Jonah, the very first uh, verse, the, the Bible talks about, and it simply says this, that, that the Lord, uh, now the Lord, now the word of the Lord came to Jonah, saying, Arise and go to Nineveh, that great and wicked city, for it's come up before me. And I want you to go there, and you're going to preach to the city and to the country of Nineveh. But Jonah did not do as God had told him. But before you judge Jonah, if you know the story, remember, you just pointed at your neighbor and said, Hi, my name is Jonah. Because truly today, as a pastor of this church, I struggle with the spirit of Jonah. I struggle with what God wants and what God expects out of me and what I want. Because God's plan is nothing like my plan. Sometimes I try to alter my plan a little bit so it looks a little bit more like God's plan. Do I have anybody that says, yes, I do struggle with that? It is our nature that we struggle with the fight of our flesh warring against our spirit. Someone said, well... What wins? It's like the old man said, the dog that you feed the most is the dog that wins. The dog that is stronger. I ask today, what are we feeding? Are we feeding the spirit of Jonah? Or are we feeding the spirit of Christ? Are we feeding what our nature and what our flesh wants and success in life? Or are we more concerned about the eternal? The Bible says this, Lay not up for yourself treasures upon this earth. Where men do break through and steal and moss and rust, do come in and tarnish it. But lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven. 
For where your treasures are, that's where your heart will be also. Hi, my name is Jonah. Now, a pastor is not, and you know that I believe it is the will of God for God's church to prosper. I believe Deuteronomy 28, it's God's will for the church to be the head and not the tail. I believe it is the will of God for the church of the living God to be the lender and not the borrower. I believe in those things. But sometimes we get so caught up with the temporal that we forget about the eternal. The Bible says that we have no promise of tomorrow. The Bible tells his disciples, take, take no thought for tomorrow. And as you go, take not clothes, don't take food, just go. My God, that is a big trust to ask of someone. Just go. When we prepare to leave, we, we go through and we bring things and we bring credit cards in case we lose cash. Because we realize that we live in a world that doesn't flow so much on the cash. It's more credit card. But then I bring cash in case I lose my credit card. Or in case the credit card don't work. You see, there's things about this life that we have no certainty in. That we have no no control of. But the thing that we do have control of is if we will submit ourselves to God, a living sacrifice, holy and acceptable unto God, which is our reasonable service. But we find that Jonah did not do that as God had instructed him to do. But instead he paid the fare and he boarded a ship and he said, I will flee. From the presence of God, I will put distance in between me and the presence of God. So we understand that Jonah paid the fare and said, I'm going to Tarsus. Now when we read that, unless you study and you know a little bit of the history, and I've tried to make myself more knowledgeable about it today so I could help you understand. The distance in between Nineveh and Tarsus was a vast distance. Tarsus is actually located... Uh, right off of the Tigris River, which is in modern day Iraq. More than 500 miles east of Jonah's hometown. Tarsus was actually 2,500 miles from Nineveh. When the Lord spoke to Jonah, Jonah said, It's not enough that I say no, I've got to flee. I've got to get out of the presence of the Lord. And the Bible said that he paid that fare. And he got on that ship. And he said, I will get out of the presence of God. You see, it's something about us that when we're in the presence of God, we, our flesh, is more prone to give in to what God wants. But five minutes outside the door of the church, Jonah comes alive. And we say, I would, and I could, but it's going to cost me too much. I'm here to tell you today, if you want the blessings of God, you need to stop counting the cost and just say, God, I am all in. Whatever you want from me, I, am in. I don't care if people say that I've lost my mind. I don't care if people call me a holy roller. I don't care what they say. They call me a Bible. Th I don't care. I am all in. I want what you have for me. I'm tired of being Jonah. Clap your hands once again. And so he gets on this ship and he's leaving and he, he gets out there and he's thinking, hey, uh, you know, I, I mean, it takes several days to go 2,500 miles. And so he's on this ship and, and everything's going good and he's not feeling the presence of God and he's put out, well, I'm, uh, you know, I got away from that and God will get somebody else to go and, and I ain't got to wear, put it far, far from my mind. But just like us, when we try to flee from the presence of God, when we try to run from the call of God, God will send a storm. God will send a tempest. And the Bible said that this great tempest arose. And the ship was tossed. And the ship began to break. And it looked like it all lies would be destroyed. 
And the men of the ship, the shipmen begin to get together and they begin to cast lots and, and to see what, how this lot fell. And when they had cast the lot, the, the, you all know the story how it fell upon Jonah and they begin to question Jonah. What have you done? What have you done? Are you a murderer? Are you a thief? That this evil has come upon us and we're all going to perish. And Jonah had to say, no, I'm not a thief. No, I'm not a murderer. In reality, I'm a prophet of God. I'm a preacher. But I am running from the call. I am running for my purpose. My desire is much stronger than my purpose. And then he said to them, the only way that you will stop this is if you'll cast me overboard. And they said, oh, we don't want to do that. We don't want, if you're an innocent man, we don't want your blood. But we know the story how that Jonah was cast off of that ship. And the Bible said God had, had sent a great fish that swallowed Jonah up. So you see, the, the storm didn't stop when Jonah got for Jonah. The storm ceased for the people that was on that. Have you ever wondered why sometimes your entire family has peace, but you ain't got no peace? Woo! Have you ever thought about everybody around you is prospering, but it seems like you in the storm of your life? Have you ever wondered what the problem might be? It's because, hey, I am Jonah. I am running. I will not submit. I'm going to live my life. I'm going to do what I want to do. And so Jonah is cast overboard, and the Bible said, in the belly of the whale. In the belly, he said, I cried out, Three days and three nights in the belly of hell. He, he compared that belly of that fish as being in hell. Three days and three nights. And I said, God, if you'll look down upon my affliction, I'll go to Nineveh and I will preach to Nineveh. Now, Pop, you've studied the Word of God, and I don't know if you've ever run across, I don't know where that well puked him up. I don't know if he's at the shore of Nineveh, but Jonah made his way to Nineveh, and he preached. When we begin to research why Jonah didn't want to go to Nineveh, Nineveh was a bunch of pagan worships. They were idolatrous. And so Jonah, being a prophet of the Lord, a preacher of the Word of God, uh, Jonah did not like the Ninevites. Did it sound like us? You, I'm not asking for a show of hands unless you just really just want to show out, you know, and show yourself and say, I'm not afraid. How many here got somebody you don't like? You just don't like them. You don't care if they come to church or not. Because I really don't want to sit in the church. I was talking several months ago with a, a gentleman that, that came to church here and and he said, you know, I, I know that a lot of people fell out with you and left, and I didn't leave the church because uh, I fell out with you. I still love you. You're still my pastor. I, I still call you for advice. I still lean on you. But I just got some people in that church I don't like. <laughs> We're talking about getting down to where the rubber meets the road. We're talking about reaching the world, and we're going to reach people that we, going to, we don't like. Uh, Brother Jimmy Tony was preaching, and, and he was telling you pastors in Gainesville, and he made this a statement, and I thought it was a very good statement. He said, I, I, I've heard people in my church say, I'm so sick and tired of walking through the foyer of our church out by our coffee bar, and all you smell is marijuana. What reason being, they had started reaching out to the homeless and they were coming in and, and they were coming in. He said, you know, I got one thing to say to you. If you're sick of smelling marijuana uh, there, you know, I don't know what to tell you about that, but maybe what you ought to do is close down your coffee bar and open up a snack bar and feed them when they come to church and then feed them the Word of God. You say, what are you saying? That's where God is trying to put His church. We have hid for so many years, we've hid out in these four walls of our churches we have built cathedrals we have built churches that you we have they're so beautiful that even god himself don't even feel comfortable in but we got our little click and that's all we're gonna let in because we don't want anybody that might call somebody to ride by and say hey did you see the homeless 
standing out in front of that church waiting till they unlock that church door. Did you see that? Did you see the way they were dressed? Them people stink down there. I, I remember when I first come here as a, as a pastor, I remember them saying there was some churches in town that if you went and visited that church, they would actually refer you to this church. Because they didn't want those kind of people. We must understand that God is trying to get us to get into a, a, a place of submission. That we say, not my will, but thy will be done. And so Jonah spit up on dry ground and he went to Nineveh and preached even though he didn't. You know, in Jonah's mind, great Bible studiers and Men that know more about and understand, have more understanding of the Word of God, they said, Jonah didn't want them to be saved. He wanted God because he didn't like them. You, can we take a pause? Is there somebody that their lifestyle, you don't like them? You don't like the lifestyle? And because of the lifestyle that they've chose, it's turned into you don't like that person. Check yourself. I'm going to give you several checks today that you can check yourself and see are you loving like God loved? Are we just a sounding brass and a tinkling cymbal and we come to church and we pat a cake for Jesus and we sing our little worship songs that a lot of times never even get our hands lifted up but we come and we appease ourselves going home and say, I please God. I went to church this morning. I was in the house of the Lord. I know that you can be at church and not be at church. It is so discouraging. I was talking with uh, someone yesterday on the phone. He said, I don't know how you do it because I sit on the back. And I look around and I see people with their head down. And I see people doing everything they can but listen at you. How do you do it? I said, i got to realize for everybody that sits there that don't want to hear what i got to somebody wants to hear that God wouldn't speak it to me. We live in the most unmannerable world. We don't teach our kids manners. Some of us don't have any manners. We don't know how to act in church. We don't care about how we look in church. We just come to church because we just want to keep God off our back. I didn't hear amen on that one. I don't want God to take my things away from me. So I go to church. And I'll praise God. And I love God. And when I'm there, I really feel something. And I really feel like I want to change. But Monday morning, when I look in the mirror, it ain't the pastor. It's Jonah. I got to get this done. I need X amount of dollars. In order to sustain myself. And I'm not preaching against making money. You know how pastor feels. I believe a man ought to work and aren't to love to work. I believe that. But I'm talking about putting the cart in the horse where it belongs. What the word of God said. Seek first the kingdom of God and his righteousness. So I come to church and. And we go to our prayer room and we pray in the presence of God. Never one time. We've been going back there for several months now. I can't tell you one time that I ever went and didn't feel the presence of God. Now we went there a couple times to pray some devils out. Because some evil spirits that were there. But the presence of God has always been there in that prayer room. And I go there and, and I say, oh God, strengthen me. Because I know what you want out of me. And I know what you expect out of me. And I come out here and I preach to you. Hey, listen, I want to tell you something. If you hadn't realized today, if you hadn't realized, you just say this, pastor preaching to himself today. 
Don't say that pastor is up there with the whooping stick and, and he's beating me upside the head. I'm being very transparent with you today. I am in a very uncomfortable place today, and I'm going to go a little deeper and share some things with you. I'm very uncomfortable today, so uh, don't say pastor's beat me up again today. I went to you every time I go to church, pastor beating on me, beating on me. No, no, pastor's not beating on you. You take it that when I'm correcting you, I'm loving on you. And if you'll ever understand, it don't matter how hard I preach to you, I'm preaching to you out of love, not out of hate. I know we don't like it. I used to hate it when my mama said, I whip you because I love you. And I thought, I wish you hated my guts. <laughs> or this hurts me worse than it's hurting you. I don't think so. Let me have that fly flap. Let me walk on you a couple times. And we'll see what really hurt. But she was speaking inside the heart. And my heart is a pastor. I want to be a good pastor. Can I really be real with y'all today? And today, after service, you may want to get another pastor. But I want to be real. I'm tired of fighting the spirit of Jonah. I'm tired of coming to church and in the presence of God. I feel so strong, and I feel so strong in the Lord that I could storm hell with a water pistol. But Monday morning, when I look in the mirror, I don't see the pastor. But I see the man that's got to get up and go provide for his family and make a good living. And, and I'm not, don't misunderstand. I'm not talking about pastor wanting to, to, to get rid of everything or lose everything I own. I'm not talking about that. But I'm telling you, church, if we can reach that place of commitment to God, if we can under, really understand, if I can bring it down and make you understand the will of God for your life and what you want for your life is 2,500 miles apart. We're not even closed. But we all struggle. I've struggled since I was just a, a young man. At the age of 13 years old, I re received my first prophecy that I was called to the ministry. Now I would preach at a very young age. But at 13 years old, Sister Twan, I'd done seen enough hurt. And my father, all I ever known him to be was a pastor. Uh, he pastored, that's what I mean. He worked a little bit on side, but he was a pastor. He's a great pastor. He loved people. Oh, if I could have the love for people that my dad had for people. And I love people. But I'd seen him lay on the floor and weep and cry over lost souls and people making bad decisions. I watched him have a nervous breakdown. I, I watched him spit up pieces of blood that looked like pieces of liver that would come out from worrying and praying and fasting and seeking the face of God. And I said, I don't want anything to do with that. You see, my nature ain't that. And I watched the struggles. I, I watched the times that they had to believe God for the next meal that would be put on our table. I, I watched as they had to believe God that God would help him fix a car on the side of the road and, and get to church and smell like gasoline to go preach to some lost soul. And he walked in and care what he smelled like. He preached the same. If he, and my daddy never wore really, uh, he, they didn't spend a lot of money on their clothing, and maybe that's the reason I'm a little frivolous with that, because of the way they done, but I can remember there was a lady in my church that every year for my daddy's birthday, she bought him a Botany 500 suit, that don't mean nothing to you, but that's what Bob Barker wore, the star of the price is right, and this lady would go and spend, and I'm talking about that in a day, like $200, that'd be like 3000 and she'd bring my daddy that suit, and he'd wear that. But I watched him on the side of the road. He'd unbutton that suit and throw it in, in the back seat. And he'd get wrenches and he'd unhook fuel lines and blow back through that fuel line and then get up. And, and I'm thinking, if that had to me, I just went on back home. So I'm y'all just, I, I couldn't make it. Car broke down. But Pop, he went on. Because he had to realize, he had come to the realization that what he was doing for God was more important than anything else that he was doing. And so at 13, I, I said, no, I'm not doing that. I ain't going to do it. I'm going to be a millionaire. Now, you imagine, most kids at 13 don't, well, I guess maybe today because of the media and stuff, maybe they do think about. But, you know, at 13 years old, I was thinking of ways and conniving, figuring out how 
that I, I, I could be a millionaire. My mom died when I was 16 years old, and I kept thinking, I'm going to be a millionaire one day. So I got involved and started uh, amateur boxing, and, and I'm not bragging, I was very, very good at what I was doing. So I began to chase that dream that I'm going to be world champion one day. And I was good enough that I had beat the world champion in the Golden Gloves boxing match. He wasn't the world champion then, but he went on to become the world champion. And it become my God. It become my Tarsus. 2,500 miles from what God. And I debate with my daddy and I say, if you just shut up and leave me alone, quit fighting me, I'm going to go world, win the world championship. I'm going to come back and build you a brand new church and you'll never want for nothing. He said, that ain't the way God wants to build his church. And he knew. But see, Saturday night, Sunday morning, Wednesday night, I want to do what God wanted. But those other days, when I looked in the mirror, I was Jonah. I'm preaching today, and I'm just asking you to evaluate yourself. What do you see? What did you see today? Oh, Sister Twan, I told her when I walked in, she looked so pretty today. And I said, oh, you look pretty. Tomorrow she might not look that pretty. She probably won't dress up as much tomorrow. But not because of the dress. But when you look in that mirror tomorrow morning, Sister Twana, who will be staring at you? Will it be to one of the lady that God has put the spirit of prophecy and wisdom and knowledge on? Or will it be that fight that, yo, God, I, I, God, I, I know what you want, but that's 2,500 miles away, God, and how am I going to get there? You know how you get there? You submit to God. You submit. You submit to what God wants. And so I began running from the Lord, and, and the Lord beat me up, and bad things happened to me. I got involved in drugs at a very young age. I, I began to drink at a very young age, all because I said, this drinking will put me 2,500 miles away from God. But I want to tell you something. You can disqualify yourself in the eyes of men, in the eyes of the people that you set and you go to church with. But you'll never disqualify yourself from God. God said, I called you and I'll qualify you. I don't care where you've been. You may have been in the pig pen. You may be casting your pearls before the swine. But one day you're going to put them pearls around your neck and realize you have got the pearl of great price. <laughs> Finally, about the age of 20 years old, I gave up on the boxing career. And I said yes to the Lord. I took out on the evangelist field to age 20 years old with just a few hundred dollars in my pocket. Going to preach my first revival, not knowing that if I would have another one. But revival after revival, I began to preach. And God began to do great things in my ministry. And, and, and I, I thought, this just really ain't so bad after all. There was perils and there were storms on the journeys. And they were bad times. There were times that I preached for three weeks and hardly just barely had enough money to make it to the next place. What the price that was on the menu was a lot more important to me back then than what was on the menu. Today I've been blessed by God and the majority of the time I don't have to look at the price on the menu. But I ask what price did we pay to get where we're at? So for several years there I evangelized and finally I felt the call of God and it was time for me to leave my home church and leave my family. And there's something about us, oh, it's we love. We'll die for each other. We love each other. And, and we, we just do anything we can to help each other. And I finally, I had to leave my home church. And I had to move to Loosedale, Mississippi, where I'd sat under a very hard preacher. He was nothing like my dad. He was my oldest brother. Where he would chew on my ears and he would cause so much... Uh, frustration in my life and, and, and put me through this process and I didn't understand that process. But a year later I understood it when I walked to his office and said, thank you brother for all them rough talks, all them beatings that you gave me because at 23 years old I was elected a senior pastor in my first church. 23. I look back and I think, many people were nuts. <laughs> he was a kid. 
I made a lot of mistakes, but we saw revival and we, we saw souls coming to the kingdom, born into the kingdom of God. We've seen cancers. We've seen people walk out of wheelchairs. We've seen blinded eyes open. And, and, and we just seen all kind of miracles of God during that time because I, it was a time in my life for, for those, those couple of years there that you see that when I looked in that mirror, it says, Twan, every morning I saw the man of God, that God had called me from my mother's womb. It was prophesied, God called you from your mother. And when I looked in the mirror, that was the man that I saw. Jonah was gone. And now I am in the perfect will of God. God began to use us and things happen and God could, God confirm and you know when you're 23 years old you need something to happen to confirm you people gotta believe you you know because I'm telling you I, I don't follow many 23 year olds around not for any length of time and God began to move and revival began to break out we seen that little church as it began to grow and to where that little church it was it was just packed out and, and <clears throat> God is just doing everything that I felt like he was supposed to do, and we, we're just doing everything that we... You see, because what God does depends on what you do. God reacts to what you act upon. You can sit there with your dreams, and I'm going to, and I'm going to, and God never does nothing. Until that widow woman reached down in that barrel pot and got that last... <laughs> Cake out for the man of God. God never increased the meal or the oil. But when she wretched that barrel by faith, she said, what are you saying? God ain't going to, we can have, and we are having meetings, we're having plenty, and we're doing great, and we're getting focused. But I want to tell you something. When God blesses is when we take that first step by faith and say, we don't have the money to do it. I don't know where it's coming from, but I step out on faith. The man that I see in the mirror, John is dead! And now I'm looking at a new man, and so we see God moved, and during that time, we were, it was not with, without opposition. There were people in that church that they thought, I, as the church grew, they thought I was too young to be there, and I was. They were right, Brother Albert, but God said, I put him there so you don't fight him. And we had people rise up against us, and I seen God move them out of the way. And you see, I'm talking about when you submit to God, when you trust God. When you can trust God so much, Reese alluded to last week a lady that it, the Lord spoke to me and said, tell her that if she don't change her attitude, that in 30 days she's going to die. And she mocked and she made fun of me. In 29 days she made it fun of me. And the 30th day I walked into the hospital when the doctor walked out and told her husband we couldn't save her. Fear fell upon that church. The church had respect for the pastor. They honored the man of God. And we continued to move. And, and it was just, but it's just church. And somebody asked me at Bot said, how's church going? I said, it's church. Because there's always going to be a problem at the church. If there's no problem nowhere else, there's going to be a problem at the church. But it don't change the plan of God. And, and after being there, I, I took that church at... At 23 years old and at 29 years old, I can remember on Sunday morning after preaching everything that I knew to preach, I, I can remember the message that I preached because Reese asked me, how can you remember those things like that? It's just, I, I, I can't remember a lot of things, but things I can remember, they never leave my mind. I remember I, I drove in from going to preach a funeral of a dear friend that had lost their lives in Jackson. When I got home, it was trouble at the church, and so I said, I'll just come back home. And as I drove through Tropper, Mississippi, Bill, Mississippi, I woke my wife up and I said, I'm going to resign in the morning. She said, okay. She went back to sleep because she thought I was joking because we was riding in the finest cars. I had an airplane. I had three wheelers. I had four four wheelers. I, I had anything I could want. God had blessed me. I didn't have to work. All I had to do was be a pastor. But see, during the process of a church burning and me building another church basically by myself with very little money, I wore myself out and I began, I become carnal. And then when I went to the mirror every morning to shave my face or to brush my teeth, I wasn't looking at Pastor Hoyt. I was looking at Jonah. And I'm admitting things to you today that I've never come to grips with. Maybe this is my third step to the church. Fourth step to the church. To me. Because 
I am so hungry for food, God. I am so hungry to see people that need God find God, but they're going to find Him when the church becomes hungry for lost souls. So I did. I blowed her mind and everybody else's mind. On Sunday, I preached the message. The altars were full. The title of my message was, What in hell do you want? What are you willing to go to hell for? And I preached that message and I went to my office. A lady that was had become like a mother to me. And I never thought she'd ever betray me. I thought she would stand with me. But when she came, I knew I could see the spirit that was upon her. And I looked at her and I thought Judas is sitting in front of me. And I can't believe it because it looks like my mama. She acts like my mama. She smells like my mama. But Judas is sitting in front of me. Now I remember when our conversation came to an end, my Bible was sitting there. The Bible that I gave to Rocky a few a year or so back, it was a Schofield that my mama gave to me for my 13th birthday, affirming that I would preach. And I remember that Bible sat in her pot just like it was yesterday. And when I finished that conversation, I said, I love you and I'll always love you, but I'm done. I'll never, ever, ever preach again as long as I live. By Tuesday evening, I had left Loosedale. And I'm living back in Jackson, Louisiana. And now every time I look in the mirror, it's Jonah. It's not the man that cares about God. All I want to do is get 2,500 miles away from the call of God and from God. But I'm going to tell you something. God can't complain. God will prepare a storm for you, and He will He will He will put you in the bellies of hell where you just pray, God, let me be the delivered out of here and just to redeem the time my life fell apart I tried I tried to go to church but I really just didn't like church people I just didn't like them I didn't trust them because all most of my life what I've really seen out of a lot of people and a lot of church people that I let get close to me was hurt and betrayal and disappointment and so I separated myself from the people that really loved me because I didn't understand that they had problems too what did Reese say? It's okay not to be okay. But in that day, Pop, all I could do was backslide. I didn't have anybody to minister to me and say, we realize you're suffering and you're, you you know, I never called it depression, but probably it was depression. Never realized that. Never had nobody reach out to me. I had people love me. I had preachers reach out to me. But the majority of the world, I had, I had isolated my own self. There is a danger in isolating yourself from people that love you. And let me just state this here today. Because somebody don't agree with you don't mean they don't love you. Sometimes the most loving person in the world is the person that can say you're wrong. You're wrong. I didn't get a lot of it wrong. I got a lot of sympathy. It's like we know what you're going from. Other preachers talk to me and said... Brother Hoyt, we understand what you're going through with, and you was too young to go through it. It was much too strong. It was the greatest mistake of my life, walking away from that church. I've never admitted that. But it was a mistake. You know why it's a mistake? Because God didn't tell me to go. In fact, God said, Stay. There's three more giants, and when you kill these three giants, you're going to have a revival. But my feelings was hurt. My pride was hurt. And when my pride got hurt, I was worried. I was weary from building the church. The church is built, we enjoy it, but I'm still weary. And I'll be honest with you, I was spiritually dead and spiritually backslid. Even though I was going to the pulpit every Sunday morning and preaching to people, squalling and crying and getting the Holy Ghost, but in my own life, I was dead. In my own life. Until it brought me to a place that I never thought I'd go. Back into the world. Things that I'd done in the belly of hell before I ever cried out. I guess it was more like the storm than in hell. Things that I'd done I don't repeat and I don't like to talk about. And I don't want to think about those things. 
because they say the most ruthless and rotten, untrustworthy person in the world is a backslid preacher. And I think I was him. And when I looked in the mirror, I said, where is the man that you used to be proud of? But I trade it for bright light. And a lot of, uh, you're great. I like to hear you sing. I like to watch you perform. All these things. I trade it for that until one day when God said, now I prepare the fish for you. I'd owned my own vehicle, Brother Albert, since I was 13 years old. But in the last part of 1999, I was on foot. I watched the repo man as he come and hooked to my truck, tore it away. I got to the place that I felt I'd fail my family so miserably that I begged God to kill me and even thought about killing myself. But God had a plan. Because none of us still needed to hear what I had to say. And so after going through hell, I finally, I, I, I realized that I was the problem. And I was my own worst enemy. I quit blaming everybody else for my problem. And I said, God, I'll do whatever you want to do. You know, he sent me back to Loose Tail. Living two and three miles from people that had hurt me and tried to destroy me and lied on me and talked about me. And God sent me right. You see, I thought... I th and, and I think it was part of the humbling process for me. But God said, i got to put you back where they can get to you. Because when you are willing to go to Nineveh, they're going to come to you. And when I went back there, struggled, embarrassed, broke, no money, God began to bless me. In a year's time, God had blessed me on th three vehicles. And was getting ready to move into a brand new home paid for. God had blessed me. But you see, in the belly of hell, I cried out and I said, God, if you'll deliver me out of here, I promise you, I'll never be the same. And there my road to recovery started. And then I wound up going to start a church in Dulac. And we seen great success. Same thing I seen the first church, but the finances wasn't there. Wound back up in Jackson, Louisiana, helping my brother. And from Jackson, Louisiana, the Folgers called me. God had tremendously blessed me because I'd made great sacrifice. And because of that sacrifice, he began to open up his windows of heaven, and he began to bless me, and I began to look at, at numbers in my bank account that I really didn't even know how to write them. I'm not bragging, I'm bragging on God. And then I began to feel the tug of God saying it's time. But I said, no, not yet. Just three more million. Let me have three more million. And then I'll go preach to the homeless. I'll go preach to the drug addict. But I need three more million. Because if I get three more million, I'll be able to build a house full. I'm always thinking, Pop. You know me. I got something always in my mind. If I'm not saying anything, it's because I'm thinking. And with that, it was always something else. It was always a storm because you see God will use the storm to get out of you what he wants out of you. And finally till my life was destroyed and my family was destroyed and I thought I'd never preach again. And I'm looking in the mirror every day and I'm seeing Jonah in the mirror I, mean, I said, God, I can't, I don't want to live. And then God sent me a pearl by the name of Reese. It didn't start out right, but it didn't take us long to get it right because we still wanted to please God. And she asked me one morning when she had, I flew her in from Houston because at this time I still had a lot of money. I could buy airplane tickets and could flew there myself if I, if I wanted to but I couldn't because I still on an ankle bracelet I couldn't leave the state Pentecostal preacher on an ankle bracelet who'd ever thought but she'd come into my life 
I remember the day before she made her decision and said, yes, I'll marry you. She said, do you ever pass or preach again? I said, positively not. She said, good, let's get married. And we did. And I began to purchase a ticket to Tarsus and run from the presence of God until I got to the place and God got me into a place that I realized I was going to die if I didn't say yes. And I said yes. From there to Healing Heart Ministry there in Bay St. Louis, we've seen God do great things and we touched a lot of lives to here in Pearl River, Louisiana. I'm so glad I said yes. But today, what I want to end this service with and open these altars up and give you all a chance to come and pray today. But the truth tomorrow morning, Pop, when I get up, I look in the mirror. 